one for your customer coverage on the 2.4 and one for your bridge links on the 5 gigahertz band. Now, I know in the previous slides I was showing pictures of an outdoor mesh, but meshes are very common in the indoor environment as well. If you look at the Cisco certification syllabus, it does have the indoor mesh, but the outdoor mesh is not on the syllabus. So it is important that you understand the different applications for an indoor mesh deployment. And here you see that I've listed two examples for an indoor mesh deployment. Now warehousing, manufacturing, some of the retail locations, they have wide open spaces and it can be very difficult to run an Ethernet cable across those large areas. And so quite often it's easier to use the Wi-Fi as a bridge to connect the access points rather than running a cable to the access point. Other locations that you'll come across may be a hotel environment where you've got a big atrium area and again they just can't run the ethernet cable. I've also come across this in theatre houses where we just weren't able to run an ethernet cable to the access points on either side of the theatre to give you coverage. The other one that I've come across is the historical buildings um, and particularly where I've come across this has been in England but you'll find this uh, around the world is that a lot of buildings are protected and you cannot drill holes in the walls and put in ducts etc and so quite often you physically are prohibited from putting a cable in and in these situations running a access point bridge makes an ideal solution. So when you think about an indoor mesh you'll typically think about using the 5 gigahertz for the backhaul between the access points and the 2.4 gigahertz for the client access just like we talked about before. Now the thing to watch for when you're in the indoor environment is the question of whether or not you're going to support voice. So earlier on I told you that in a non-voice network Cisco recommends no more than three or four hops. Well every time your traffic has to do a hop from a mesh access point to another mesh access point it is incurring latency. If you're supporting voice for your clients to be connected on the 2.4 gigahertz band, then you also need to support voice on your backhaul on the 5 gigahertz band. And in this situation, Cisco recommend that you keep the distance between access points smaller. And what that means is that then you'll be up at the higher data rates and it also recommends that you do no more than two hops. If you do both of those things, it should be good enough to support a voice call across the backhaul as well. So I added this diagram to the picture because I thought it was quite amusing to find a typo in one of the Cisco documents, and I found this in the Cisco Mesh Access Point document. But I also wanted to point out something which will really help you when you're doing your site survey planning. As I mentioned, you need to do one plan for the bridge connections and one plan for your client coverage. And see in this picture, the circles there are representing your client coverage and the radius of that client coverage in the Cisco diagram illustrates to be 125 feet. And you'll notice that in the Cisco diagram that the distance between two access points is 250 feet. And so what Cisco is saying is you want to keep the distance between two access points for the bridging capability to be no more than 250 feet. But in fact, when you're deploying it for voice, you want to have those cells overlapping by 20% in the 2.4 gigahertz band and so if your access points are less than 250 feet apart then your actual cell radius in order to get 20% overlap in the 2.4 gigahertz band 
actually needs to be larger than 125 feet. And the main thing I'm pointing this out is when you're doing your planning, you need to make sure that both your cell coverage for your client makes sense for voice and you have to make sure those bridge links make sense for voice. So a couple of times in this lesson, I've talked about the signal strength at the cell boundary. One of the tools that is actually on the Cisco certification exam syllabus that can be used to measure the signal strength is the Cisco Spectrum Expert. And that is illustrated here in this diagram. And you can see that it consists of a card bus, which has an internal antenna, but can also be attached to an external antenna, as you can see in this diagram here. In this demonstration, we're going to look at the received signal strength using the Cisco Spectrum Expert tool. So let's start that tool. Click on that. Yes, we want to use external antennas. So here you can see it's discovered two access points. Now let's go through what is discovered here. So the first access point is Avril's network. And this is my home office access point and is a BGN device. And I also have a separate SSID setup called Guess for when visitors come. So both of those are the same access point, just two different SSIDs. And so no surprises, therefore, that they have the same signal strength. Now, the second access point that I've got set up is a Cisco access point, and it's a dual mode access point. So it's operating on two different frequencies. I have it operating on channel one in the 2.4 gigahertz band, and I also have it operating on channel 36 in the 5 gigahertz band. And the Cisco Spectrum Expert is sitting right next to this access point. And so over here, you can see really good signal strength. And no surprises here that the signal strength in the 5 gigahertz band is lower because, of course, my signals attenuate more. So you'd always expect the signal strength in the 5 gigahertz band to not be as good as the 2.4 unless you're using different antennas. Now notice here my neighbor just popped up here and my neighbor is quite some distance away. So you can see the signal strength here is minus 90 dBm. So I wouldn't be able to connect to that network because it's just too far away. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my Cisco Spectrum Expert and walk it to my son's room which is about 100 feet away, and we're going to take a look at what happens to my signal strength. And at, what you're going to expect as I move away from my access point is you're going to expect that signal strength to get weaker. So let's go and move the Cisco Spectrum Expert tool. So this is interesting. You can see here that it's discovered my son's Xbox because I've now moved the Cisco Spectrum Expert over to his room. And that's a very low powered device, but because I'm fairly close to it, it's just picking up that signal. Now look here at the dual mode access point. The 5 gigahertz band is no longer showing. I've gone far enough away from the access point that I've actually gone out of coverage and the Cisco Spectrum Expert can no longer see that device. But I'm still able to connect in the 2.4 gigahertz band. But notice the signal strength has dropped to minus 74 dBm. So it's so weak that if I was planning a Cisco VoIP network, that would be too weak for me to be able to connect with a Cisco IP phone. So a few terms you should be familiar with. Antenna gain. When we were talking about a bridge connection, I mentioned the fact that most of those use a directional antenna. So a directional antenna 
is an antenna that has the ability to take the energy it receives and focus it towards the other antenna. And how much the antenna is able to focus that energy into one direction is called antenna gain. I'd mentioned a couple of times the term cell boundary. Cell boundary is where your received signal strength drops to a level that if you go beyond that cell boundary, you can no longer effectively communicate with that access point. And so in that situation, you should be handing over or roaming to another access point. So a Cisco mesh is when access points can directly communicate with each other using the Wi-Fi radio. So one mesh access point can communicate with several other mesh access points. The root access point is the one access point that provides the connection to the wired network. So a mesh access point by itself may be able to communicate with other mesh access points, but may not have a connection to the wired network. And so communications coming to that mesh point, if they're due to go out to the wired network, they have to go through the root access point. So here's some of my favorite resources, and these are all Cisco documents. And you should always check that you have the latest version when you're downloading it, because Cisco does periodically make updates, and you want to make sure you're not working from an old version. I personally like to take an electronic copy of these out with me when I do my site survey, just in case I need to refer back to it. And you can see here there's one for doing the voice over the wireless networks. There's one for the location-based networks, one if you're doing a mesh. And the last one, which is kind of coupled with the voice over wireless LAN, but is actually a site survey guide for actually deploying the Cisco IP phones. And I think if you look at these four documents, you really have everything you need to know about setting the parameters up for doing your site survey with Cisco equipment. So what did we cover? Well, we went through all of the different survey models. We started with a wireless LAN, which is for data only. You know, this might be somewhere like an airport where people are really expected to connect with a laptop, not looking to support location services or VoIP calls. The high density wireless LAN is really where you've got a lot of uses in a very small space. And how do you support that kind of throughput that those users need? So that was the high density wireless LAN. We then talked about the voice over wireless LAN and really enabling you to see the differences you have to make when you're deploying IP phones. Then we looked at the location aware wireless LANs and this is where you're deploying the Wi-Fi RFID tagging technologies. We then took a look at the Cisco Spectrum Expert and how I can use that tool to measure the received signal strength. And we saw that in different locations as I moved around, some of those locations were good enough to support a voice over wireless LAN. But when I moved further away from the access point, a more difficult RF environment, I was no longer able to get enough signal strength to support a voice call, even though I could continue to support data traffic.